And maybe not, but I, I lean towards no. But I think it's something every candidate ought to consider just out of integrity sake. And so I have to assess is this going to give me uh, any type of advantage? I don't think so. And so I continue to serve. And that's what I want to do, continue to serve the city. All right, Ms. Holland. Um, I, I don't believe that I would support that. Um, uh, I sit on the city's um, nuisance abatement board, which I've been sitting on for a lot of years, and I wouldn't want to have to resign that board in order to run, and it, it doesn't really have any direct correlation to the, to, um, the position that I'd be running for, so I, I'd be a little reluctant to, to support that. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the topic of the homeless. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dorfman. I oh, apologize. You guys are good. Uh, yes, I do support it. I resigned from the Sarasota Sports Commission when I decided to run. I used to write op-ed uh, pieces for the Observer, which I stopped doing when I decided to run. I think uh, if you're going to run, you resign from the board. If you don't win, you can get back on the board. But I think you, you're going to open yourself up to a lot of bias, and you may very well be biased. And, and you know, the opportunity exists to use a bully pulpit again to, to further your cause. So I think it's safe all around to resign. Then you don't have to worry about bias. Thank you. All right, now the topic of the homeless. There have been a lot of instances where we've, we've dealt with the homeless we've embraced the homeless or we basically throw up our hands with the homeless and over the past couple of years people have suggested uh even from this panel that one solution is to give them bus tickets out of here another solution was to remove the five park benches at five points park and just recently one of our candidates suggested that we put up a tent city at the quay other citizens uh, have suggested that the that we relocate the salvation army from the downtown area. So I want to ask the candidates, what is the first concrete step specifically that you will take to address the homeless problem within the city? Ms. Atwell, I'm going to start with you. Well, I'm obviously a city commissioner. One minute. Okay. We're going to one minute. We, we, are, we are right now, and no, I do not believe we need to bust them anywhere. The, the, the question about the Salvation Army, absolutely not. We need to deal with this here. We in the city, city manager, uh, uh, Chief DePino, we're starting to do some real proactive work in hiring some case managers. We are starting to get input, impact from our foundations, which we have been wanting to do for so long, to fund. We have an anonymous donor that may fund uh, some caseworkers to be on the street to deal with what's happening. We need to do that with, with within and have the talent of the mental health profession to get in there. We're not talking about the global issue right now, but there is a call to action because it's reached a critical mass, as it did at Five Points, it did at Gillespie Park, but what do you now we think at, at Central Avenue. Can you be specific, though? What is the first thing that you're going to do to take, to well, take I'm, on this problem? I'm, part, I'm, I'm front and center to all this, and I want to continue to do that when I'm reelected. that we are now making efforts to work with. We are still going to work with all uh, um, the human service agencies, but we need to do something, put feet and talent and profession on the street, do some triage, look at some of the people that we have there that may want to go into case management. That's exactly what we're working on right now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tyson. Well, whoever suggested that presidium idea, uh, actually, I think if we had an army tent, but not at the presidium, and just had it in reserve, if we could put them anywhere else, rather than have them laying in the bushes in a, in a rainstorm, I mean, there needs to be a, an instantly available place. Now, we've got Salvation Army, we've got some other institutions, and uh, the jail is half full. So we do have places to put people, but the question is, is it right to put them in jail if they haven't done anything? I, I don't think it is. Uh, so. You're the one who suggested that we, we build a tent city at the but quay. So not not at the quay. Well. Now listen, now be fair. I suggested a tent city, but it wasn't at the quay. I mean, come on. Okay, well, I did you, not. what did you suggest it? Well, there's a place, uh, actually it's near the License Bureau. It's There's 40 acres, which isn't being used for anything. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do Ms. Chapman. Um, with regard to the homeless, I am so grateful. And if that anonymous donor is here, I can I ask the audience to actually calm down a little bit, please? Go ahead. 
If that anonymous donor is here who gave the money to the Community Foundation, I want to thank you because you got something started that's a good thing. This is not a police issue. This is a community services issue. And with regard to the homeless, I think that that is the first recognition that we need caseworkers rather than to use the very expensive police department, the very expensive jail to house our homeless. I do favor a one-stop center. I do not favor feeding homeless people in our city parks. What I favor for our city parks is that we bring more activities for law-abiding citizens so that the homeless will not be the most prominent use in our parks. I do believe that our police department with the uh, police chief DePino has made a lot of progress on Thank you. Hey, Mr. Dorfman. Look, I think we have, we have two issues to confront here. We have a homeless situation where, dear, but for the grace of God, go I. Uh, a homeless situation due to, to those folks who are affected due to economic issues or mental issues. We have to do something for us. The city cannot do it alone, however. We've got to have we've got to have an approach that it's the city, it's the county, it's the state, it's the nonprofits getting involved. What concerns me greatly is our vagrancy issue. And our vagrancy issue absolutely affects our everyday quality of life. If we aren't able to get the vagrants off the street, and these are the people who are vagrants by choice, who are in your face, we're going to have a problem. It's going to keep business away from downtown. It's just not a good thing. But my 10-year-old comes running up to me and says, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, there's a man going pee-pee in the bushes at City Hall. You know, that's not a good thing. So what are you going to do about it? I think the first thing we have to do is look at the city ordinances, which are grossly outdated, check out the city ordinances and find out how we can revamp the city ordinances will, will allow us to more effectively address the problem. All right, Ms. Holland. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is an issue that's very up, um, up close and personal to me, it's coming from a, an area that when they when they got rid of those benches and five points, then they came pick a Western Park. And it, it critically impacted a neighborhood that's been struggling to, to improve itself. So we have to do something. We did find out that it, it is a, it's a complicated issue because there are the legitimate homeless, and then there's the criminal element that has sort of weaved itself into this, into the, the homeless population and oftentimes they're actually taking advantage of the of the uh, homeless population so from that standpoint you have to have your your law enforcement take care of that portion of the of the element but for the legitimate homeless and the, um, then we have to do something to help and, and i support finding the models the successful models that have worked in other cities the one stop the one stop center is is certainly something that if that's successful, then we need to move forward on that. I do support in the short term the caseworkers. Okay, we're actually getting tight on time, so I'm going to, after we finish this round, we're going to speed it a little up. Um, Mr. Lumpkin. One of the questions I've asked myself as, as a candidate and a potential commissioner is how can the city of Sarasota help the homeless uh, become self sufficient without allowing a portion? of the homeless population to adversely affect others. Uh, and that's a tough question that I believe that we have to answer. Uh, Sarasota is an attractive city. Uh, we have a thriving downtown. We have wealthy people who live here. Uh, and also, it's a warm place. If you're homeless, would you rather be homeless in Chicago in February or Sarasota? So this is a, a natural place for the homeless to migrate. And so uh, I believe that any city that's effectively dealt with the homeless, and there is no one answer, Susan, because people are homeless for different reasons. We have kids who are and I think that we should all be resolved that no kids should be homeless in our city. You have some who are mentally ill. Uh, you have some who are just one paycheck away. And so we have to find a multi, I think we need to have a multifaceted approach to help those people transition to become self-sufficient. I think we actually may be on the right track with the street cleaning crew that's helping some people actually get on their feet. I believe we need to expand those kind of things. And one of the things I would do as commissioner is to gather all the service pro providers who are already doing the work, and let's develop a game plan. And I believe the city has to invest in that. I'm sorry, forgive me. We have to invest in it. And I believe cities that have done it well will say that helping the homeless actually helps okay. the bottom line. Thank you. All right, I'm going to combine the next two questions so we can move it along a little bit, and I'm going to limit you to 30 seconds. So we I can't apologize. Give a preacher a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> 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 
time. <laughs> okay, uh, with everything that you guys have just said, first, if, if you gave a specific answer, I greatly appreciate. I want you to tell me where the money's going to come from and how you're going to balance individual civil rights versus the vagrancy. And I'm going to start with Ms. Chapman. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, please. Uh, yeah, the one is not looking at it as a policing issue. It is not a policing issue. Resurrection House did a survey of who are the homeless, and just 15% of the homeless have mental illness. Most of the homeless that are appearing at, at Resurrection House actually are people who are affected by the economic downturn. The One Stop Center has been very effective, but I do not think this is a policing issue, so the civil rights issue should be a side issue. It's a fiscal issue. Okay, Ms. Holland? Well, I believe parts of it are um, uh, a legal issue. Uh, we've experienced that, so I think I think where there is illegal activity, that has to be handled by, by law enforcement. But they certainly have to have to respect the, the, the rights of the individuals. And I think, that, I think for the most part, our police department does that. Thank you. Mr. Lumpkins. Could you repeat that question? Sure. Combining what you just said, where will the money come from, and how do you plan on balancing individual civil rights versus vagrancy? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think the police, it's not their job to deal with the homeless. They ought to enforce the law no matter who's breaking it, whether it's somebody who lives in a cardboard box or somebody who lives in a penthouse. Um, I believe that, and of course, I'm a proponent of growing our way out of our financial problems. I believe that as the city grows economically, then we'll have the resources to invest in maybe the programs that are already existing, because I believe government should play a limited role, supported in some way those organizations that are helping the homeless transition. Thank you. Mr. Tyson. The city is $459 million in the hole already. Uh, the whole budget is going to have to be over overhauled. I mean, and in that process, some money will undoubtedly be funded to, found to it, at least handle the vagrancy problem. Uh, private charities may have to pick up the, what we've just called legitimate homeless. Mr. Dorfman? Specific to the vagrancy issue, I believe it is a police issue. I don't believe we're allowing the police to do their job. The police is not getting the direction they need from, uh, from city commission, city manager. Uh, I have spoken to Michael Barfield of the ACLU. We are in agreement. The city ordinances need to be revised and revamped, which, al which will allow more effective policing and allow us to address this vagrancy issue. And it will not cost another cent. The cops are on the street. Uh, we can clean up this problem if we are given the tools to clean up this problem. Ms. Atwell. It's about, it is about tools, and I think with what we're doing with the case workers, that, that, that's a beginning. It would be nice to have an angel come as far as funding and come and fund a, perhaps a one-stop uh, center. That would be good. But I, I also um, concur with two of my other um, fellow candidates that we, uh, the police, need to arrest unacceptable behavior. What happened, and I got a lot of flack from this with five points in removing the benches, it was unacceptable behavior. We had reached a critical mass. Thank we you. have to do that. Okay, my next section is talking about development. We're all interested. The first part is I want you to say yes or no is whether you have read the downtown master plan. And the second question I'm going to say is the city staff has said that they may want to repeal change or uh, repeal or change concurrency rules to allow developers to add more traffic on congestion roads than is allowed today at places such as Brookville and Geneva, for example. If this comes before you as city commissioner, will you vote for it or against it? And I'm going to start with Mr. Lumpkin. Um, yes, and uh, I would probably. Could you, could you repeat that last part? Not a problem. If this comes before you as a city commissioner, will you vote for it or will you vote against it to repeal or change the concurrency rules? That, that's tough to answer because there's so many layers to this, but I would lean toward no. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tyson. I have read the plan. I will not vote to repeal the concurrency rules. Ms. Holland. Yes, I have read it and I would, it is a difficult, multi-layered um, issue, but I would tend 
not to initial. Okay. Without further, a lot of further consideration. Mr. Dorfman. I have gone through the downtown master plan to find specific answers to issues. It is a very voluminous document. Uh, I am a big fan. Ooh. Yeah, I was going to ask if everybody can hear him. Um, I said I have gone through the downtown master plan. I am a supporter of Iwani. I think he comes with a lot of great ideas that are appropriate to our city. Uh, in terms of the concurrency, again, it is, it is a layered thing. Uh, I think in certain aspects, concern, concurrency is now almost an outmoded uh, concept. Thank you. Ms. Atwell. Yeah, state legislation now uh, allows local governments to uh, choose to do away with concurrency. I'm a believer in um, the, uh, the, the, the let's get Sarasota moving mobility fee. We need to look at a progressive <coughs> transportation mobility plan where we look at fees that will help developers mitigate that do it in a way where it's not just planning for suburbans for all it's working for multimodal it's environmental it includes operation congestion management funds Thank this you. is a progressive way to deal with this right now and we need to look at it Ms. Chapman. I have read the downtown master plan and on the planning board I've actually worked with the downtown master plan I also participated in many of the meetings, community meetings with Duwani on developing the downtown master plan. So I feel like I have a good understanding. On concurrency, I, I think uh, Ms. Atwell brought up the, uh, that this is part of the mobility plan. What is unclear is does it modify concurrency? We've certainly modified concurrency on a state level. Thank you. I don't favor changing concurrency. Okay, my next question. Should the city have put out an RFP for the property at Beneva and Fruitville instead of allowing a single buyer to have a favored status? I'm going to start with Ms. Atwell. Well, that, that happened as a sole source a while back where the staff handled it. On hindsight, it, at some point, we perhaps should have gone out, even though we are. This is a long way from being established, what's going on uh, up there with the Benderson development. They came to us. That is true. We had another company come to us, uh, Johnny Come Lately, that came, and that kind of confused and confounded the public as to they would give three million as opposed to the 1.2. So, so just I, I just want to clarify: Should you have put it out for an RFP? Uh, you know, I'm at, at the time when a, when a very reputable um, applicant comes in, you take a look at it. Okay. But thank you. in hindsight. This happens again when a sole source comes to us. Thank you. We can look at it differently. Ms. Chapman. Yes, there should have been an RFP. We would have avoided a lot of controversy if there had been. Uh, we, the public could have considered whether they wanted to maintain this as a park instead of a development. It, it should have been an RFP. Mr. Dorfman. It's, it's such a tough question, but I believe, you know, if we're going to put every piece of land we have out to an RFP, all we're going to be doing is putting out RFPs. There was a proactive approach. There was a very well-known developer with, a, with roots in the community and the history of the community who came up with a good plan. The commission looked at it. We thought it was good for the community, so they acted upon it. Um, you know, maybe the process wasn't as transparent as we would have liked to it have been. Thank you. But I believe the process, what happened was good. Thank you. Ms. Holland. This is park land and it should not be sold. So the answer is yes or no? Well, uh, RFP, RFP should be um, uh, offered for the sale of, of city land. So okay. In that, in that respect. Mr. Lumpkin. Um, first, first, I have as bad as I want to see this uh, city grow economically, and I believe that's the key to getting out of our financial problems. I have great hesitation about selling parklands. <laughs> Having said that, yes, there should have been an RFP. I think the commission created some problems for itself. I think it gives the appearance, even if it wasn't the case, that there's some underhanded deal, and I think we created some problems for ourselves. So, yes, it should have been. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. They should have resolved the question of whether or not to sell parkland first. Then, if the answer was, yes, the city wants to sell the park, okay, then put out the RFP. The way it was done was just below comment. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Some of you have said that you want to loose this 
some of the restrictions on development. If you can, if you do, can you be more specific about what you want to change? And are you in favor of increased uh, residential density in the downtown zone districts by lifting current limits on building heights? And if so, how much? I'm going to start off with Mr. Tyson. If you want to increase density, you have to put the traffic management and sewers and schools and all the other infrastructure in place first. Okay. <laughs> Are you in favor of increasing residential density in the downtown zone districts by lifting the current limits? And if, you, if so, how high would you go? Yeah, I'm still asking Mr. Tyson because I didn't, I didn't quite understand well, answer. I guess I wasn't clear, was I? No. <laughs> I think the audience gets it. Okay. So I guess we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> Ms. Chapman. I'm in favor of maintaining the density in the downtown master plan. Uh, and I'm not in favor of um, um, scrapping the downtown master plan. I do think, though, that there are areas close to downtown where uh, an increase in density would be very helpful, such as the Rosemary District, and I definitely support an increase in density there. Would you raise the height limit? In Other than what, was the, what it's already called for in the master plan? In the downtown master plan, they limited the height in order to in order to make it more human scale. So I I still support the downtown master plan. All right, Mr. Dorfman. I am in favor of more density downtown. Uh, I think we can handle more density. Dewani preached more density for a lot of reasons. If you have 200 units in a building, it's a lot easier on your infrastructure. It's a lot, a lot less costly than trying to put out 200, 200 homes and increasing small sprawl out in the country. Uh, I think we'll contribute to downtown, let the people live downtown, let them work downtown, let them spend their money downtown. In terms of height issues, I think we've got to look at it piece by piece. I don't want a 20-story building abutting a, a neighborhood that's a bunch of two-story buildings. It's a case-by-case -case situation. Ms. Holland. I do agree that specifically with the Rosemary District area, I think that has, uh, has such tremendous opportunities and possibilities. And if, if we need to adjust the master plan, while I support the master plan, um, I believe that's an area where, where an adjustment could be made. And I'm not sure um, of increasing the heights on that, but I think it's certainly worth giving it very serious consideration because I think that's that's where we need to be looking for our, our redevelopment, our economic stability. Mr. Lumpkin. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I believe a city's health is contingent on this downtown. I think cities are defined by how vibrant their downtowns are. If I mention New York or Chicago, you don't think about it.